For part two of our session, please welcome President and Chief Operating Officer of the Milken Institute, Richard Ditizio, in conversation with Chairman of Endeavour Global, Edgar Bronfman, Jr. Thank you. So, Edgar, we have a lot to speak about. We'll just kind of do a round the world. Um, let's start with technology and the speed with which technology is changing things, uh, particularly given your experience in the music industry. Uh, when you think about 35 or so years ago, the advent of the CD was novel and, and how that whole industry has been upended. Uh, talk to us about how you think technology has impacted that space in particular and then like your views on content versus the distribution. Well, obviously the, the, the first great unbundling was the album. Uh, and what technology taught all of us in the music industry was that consumers are going to get what they want. Techn technology is going to enable that. And just like uh, Tom Barrick and others were talking about the disintermediation that technology is, is creating uh, is happening across the board now for cable companies, for music companies, et cetera. And uh, the way in which people receive content and the type of content they receive is going to go through a revolution. And, and more of that control passes to me as the consumer than before, because through my device I can access anything. Um, how do you think about the regulatory framework on that? So if you're thinking about, uh, let's talk about paying, it's payments. So if I could tap my phone to yours and pay you, right, and I can do that whether we're sitting here or we're on a plane or we're in the United States, um, which geography's governance is really governing that transaction. And then the idea with music, like how is that impacting the artists? How are people accessing their content? Well, I think you've seen a tremendous increase in streaming, right? So people are accessing their content now, uh, effectively renting it rather than buying it. Uh, and, and I think I always felt that the buying model would go away, that just ha paying a set amount to have access to all the world's music uh, and to have someone organize that for you would be a very compelling uh, a uh, asset. And both Spotify and Apple have stepped into that breach and done a great job. Mm -hmm. And what do you think, kind of given your experience at Warner, what's next? Like, what do you think the, the next advent in, in that's going to be? Well, I think, I think the, the, uh, there's some fundamental issues with the industry that need to be addressed. I don't think artists are getting compensated properly for the work that they do. Spotify and Apple, those models just don't seem to generate the kind of returns that artists need. Um, uh, maybe that will change as they grow, but I think the relationship between the artist and Spotify and Apple uh, will be uh, increasingly under some strain. Uh, and it's very possible that the record labels will be caught in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's unclear whether, you know, whether and how labels will, will survive. I personally think they will, but there are others who think, who think not. Mm -hmm. So there's changes to the consumer, changes to the artist, changes to the label. How would I as an investor think about that space today? Well, I think... Uh, it's a difficult space to invest in right now in terms of the major public companies because I think content and distribution are going through dramatic, uh, dramatic changes. You saw AT&T buy Time Warner. Mm -hmm. But you know, content uh, and distribution have always struggled to live together. Uh, to, to get its pr pr greatest value, distribution wants to be exclusive. And to get its greatest value, uh, content wants to be ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that is uh, something that no one's yet solved. Uh, I do think, uh, ultimately, I, I've always said, and I believe this is true, that distribution is a commodity, uh, and it will get commodity margins over time, that uh, uh, aggregation is a service, and it will get service margins over time, and content is proprietary, and it will get proprietary margins over time. Okay. So let's pivot for a moment to Endeavor, because I know this is a, a passion of yours for a long time, and not a uh, domestic passion, but a global one, uh, focused on entrepreneurship. Tell us um, what was so engaging about this as a premise for you to get involved in. Well, Endeavor had a great, great model when it, when I, uh, when it came to me, uh, but it was small. It was in Latin America, but it, it was focused on the SME sector, which 20 years ago wasn't where people were focused. People were more focused on microfinance. Uh, the two founders said, well, 
microfinance aren't going to create jobs in the way that we, we think jobs need to be created. And there was really no focus on the SME space back then. Uh, and they started in Latin America where the, there's, no, there's not even a Spanish word for entrepreneur. That's how foreign it was to the, to the culture and the consciousness of countries in, in, in Latin America, and I would say even in Spain. Um, and 20 years later, we're in 33 countries. Uh, our entrepreneurs have created 1.5 million jobs. Wow. Uh, our entrepreneurs pay to be in the network so that hopefully we can make the entire thing self-sustaining. We have over 6,000 mentors who mentor our uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, and now we've also started to invest uh, on a rules-based basis uh, so that even at the global level, we can, uh, we can be self-sustaining. Uh -huh. So I want to go back and focus on that notion of mentorship. Well, one of the things that we do at the Institute, we have a, a Milken Scholars program. And beyond the scholarship to very smart, uh, promising children, what we find uh, they most appreciate is we create a network which helps guide them through their careers of both people who've already been through the program as well as professionals. And that, that's the part that seems to be missing in a lot of the approach here. So talk to us about what you think has been the most successful strategy around making mentorship part of the culture at Endeavor. Well, I think one thing that Mike said uh, sometime yesterday was that philanthropy is not only about money. It's about time. And so uh, at... Uh, at Endeavor, when someone goes on our local board, we're very, so each country has its own board okay. uh, and supports the local country. Uh, but we tell them it's not just your money we want, we want your time. And if you can't give us both, please don't join the board. Because it, their mentorship is going to be critical to the success of our entrepreneurs. And their networks and bringing other mentors in to help our entrepreneurs are, is critical to our success. So we, we explain up front to people exactly what it means to be an Endeavor board member and the, the time commitment and that, it, that it takes. And interestingly enough, Nagib Souris, who was uh, on the panel at yes. lunch, was our first chairman of Endeavor Egypt. Well, that's great. Yeah. yeah. So in the years uh, that you've been involved with Endeavor, what, what do you think you've learned as, as an entrepreneur yourself? I think... The, I, I think the, the biggest thing that I've learned is that mentorship is critical to entre entrepreneurship. Uh, it's very hard without it. But I would also say that I was brought up in a time when you could do well or do good. Uh, and I've come to believe that not only can you do well and do good at the same time, but that you must. Uh, I, I, I'm very sympathetic to the things that were said on stage today about proving that capitalism can be a force for good. Uh, that it can solve human problems as opposed to just take advantage of, of, of people. And of course, it does, it does do that, but not nearly to the extent that it should, and, and certainly not in a way that it's felt by so many people. Mm -hmm. And you yourself come from a significant family, and I don't only mean from a wealth perspective, I mean from a significance perspective and getting involved in causes, etc. cetera. Um, tell us about your notion of stewardship. What, what was it like growing up like that, and what responsibilities do you feel you had uh, learned from your own family? Well, I think the thing that was drummed into uh, all of us by my father and he by his father uh, was our responsibility, both as citizens and as Jews, to leave the world a better place than we found it. Uh, and he always said, if you're not making the world a better place, you're, you're not in Mike's words, living a meaningful life. Tikkun right? uh, Exactly, right. tikkun olam. And so uh, there is a responsibility that we all feel to help others and to, um, all, when I say all, our siblings, my siblings, all uh, to try and be supportive and hopefully constructive in making small parts of the world better. Mm -hmm. And I know one of the things you're doing towards that end revolves around climate change. Uh, and from an investment perspective, uh, global thermostat. So explain to me what, what's this notion of negative emissions and like where do you see the future of investing in that kind of technology? So the first thing I'd say is that nothing we do here uh, is going to matter if the world's at 100 degrees Celsius. And we're, we're on that path, and that path is extraordinarily dangerous and I think still greatly underestimated. There will be no reduction in carbon emissions. Uh, for all of the good work for decades. Because if you think about it, in the 20th century, Africa wasn't powered, mm -hmm. mostly. China wasn't powered, mostly. Uh, 
India was empowered mostly, and there you have half of the world's population, just in the, the one continent and two countries. And so, um, and most of that energy now is coal. So no matter what the rest of the world does, carbon emissions are increasing. Yeah. Uh, and sadly, even the United States uh, increased carbon emissions by 4% last year. Uh, so the only thing left for us to do, in addition to all of the remediation issues, going to renewable technology, et cetera, et cetera, all of which are critical, and hopefully we will be an entirely renewable uh, energy world in 75 or 100 years, but we're not going to get there unless we can take CO2 out of the air. It's got to come out of the air. And 10 years ago, I found someone who believed that he could do it uh, and turn it into a business. And I'm happy to say that after 10 years and a tremendous amount of technology work, our first unit is just commissioning now uh, in Huntsville, Alabama, and will move to its first commercial client where it will simply take CO2 from the air and feed it to the client uh, because there is there's actually a major shortage of CO2 for industry huh. and there's way too much CO2 in the air. Okay. And, and how do you scale that? How, how, well, it, assuming this is successful, how do you scale that so that it's impactful for climate change writ large? Well, you, you, in, in two or three ways. First of all, it's a modular system. So every time we make 5,000 ton unit, it's the same thing every time. So we get the benefits of mass production uh, and we get the benefits of scale, but it uh, means we can go quickly. I'm not saying that like the US in World War II, they made a plane every two hours. I'm not saying we could do that, but we don't have to re-engineer or redesign. So you can make lots of these units. We're gonna do the same thing with a 50,000 ton unit. Uh, it's, again, it's gonna be the same thing every time. And if you want a million tons of CO2, you'll put 20 of those 50,000 ton units down. The issue of scaling is what do you do with the CO2? And I, I believe that uh, it's true that anything you make with carbon today, you can make with carbon tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter where it comes from. And so whether it's fuel or polymers or uh, aggregates, fertilizer, concrete, uh, bil uh, building materials like carbon fiber, these are gigantic, gigantic markets. If, if we could sequester CO2 in, in aggregate, aggregates alone, if we did, did that throughout the world, we could sequester about five billion tons a year. Wow. Um, but the industry has got to scale. It's got to scale quickly because I would say that from a climate perspective, we need to be taking between five and 10 billion tons of CO2 out of the air by 2030. Mm -hmm. That's how serious it is. And I hope I'm not too uh, optimistic. Well, we heard today at lunch that Patrice Motepi, despite of all the geopolitical issues people were speaking about, the thing that he was most concerned about is climate change and its impact. How do you navigate the climate deniers? Like, it seems there's such a logical premise here uh, that if we could devote more business resources and then enact policy around the world, like, wh why do you think people are intransigent on this? Well, because it, it affects jobs. I mean, it, it, it's really, but I think that's it can that's create simple. jobs. It right? can create jobs, but unfortunately, the, the people who are going to lose their jobs have their own voices and, and they're concerned. But my point is not whether you are a climate denier or not. The truth is, even from an insurance standpoint, why wouldn't you want to take CO2 out of the sure. air? And if you can take it out of the air, you don't need to be as concerned with what's putting it up there. In other words, when we take CO2 out of the air, we take CO2 whether it came from a coal plant, whether it came from a car, it doesn't matter. It's just CO2, and we take it out of the air. Mm -hmm. um, and so my, my comment to climate deniers is just to avoid the argument. I think they're nuts, but I just avoid the argument and just focus on A, insurance, uh, B, waste management, because we're going to probably have to bury CO2 in the earth as well, and governments will pay to do that. But again, you're just taking it out of the air, which is, again, going to be critical, because we can't it's too late to move to a renewable uh, energy environment today, I mean, without doing this. But if you think about the scale of things, there are, uh, well, bil there's a billion cars on the road. Each car, is, let's call it $30,000 for electric cars. Yeah. That's $30 trillion mm -hmm. that's got to turn over. Yeah. It's not going to happen that quickly, n no matter what. And by the way, electric cars draw their energy from natural gas plants, sure from coal plants and other major polluters. So it's better than burning fuel from a fossil carbon source, but it's not the answer either. 
So I, I think this company is a good example about what you spoke about before. Right? You don't have to forfeit financial return in order to do good in the world. And that brings us to this notion of impact investing, which I think people often get tripped up on the language of that. Uh, I've heard the analogy that impact investing is like a houseboat. It's not really that great a boat, and it's not a terrific house. Um, but how do you think about it in terms of quantifying the social return to create a compelling argument to draw capital towards it? Well, I think you have to be careful with impact investing like you have to do with all investing. Uh, but I would just say that uh, the, the large problems in the world require a lot of capital to be solved. They require technology as well. And you can't amass a lot of capital unless you're making money. Uh, so if you're dependent on philanthropy or government intervention, it's not a sustainable model. So the impact investors or the people who are, who, to whom they're giving their money must figure out how to solve the problem and make money doing it. Because otherwise, they're, gonna be, they're not going to be able to scale and they're not going to be able to impact. Mm -hmm. So as we spoke yesterday at the breakfast on philanthropy, there's two outcomes. Either it's a cycle of sustainability or dependence. And I think it's wonderful that Endeavor is going towards that sustainability. In your other philanthropic endeavors with your foundation, what are you interested in? And what's been your both uh, challenges and successes that you've had? Well, I'm very <coughs> focused on Endeavor as my principal uh, on, um, uh, philanthropic effort. Uh, it's, I don't think dividing your time, I don't have that much time, is that great. But I must say I was very pleased to hear all the great comments about NYU uh, because I'm on the board of the NYU Medical Center, uh, now called NYU Langone Health. Uh, and that would say would be my other principal interest is, is medical education. Uh, and uh, m medicine and health in general. Mm -hmm. And how do you see technology impacting that space? I mean, are we near, or at least in the nascent stages, of AI being helpful towards synthetic clinical trials and the like? Like, what, what are you seeing there? I think we, we're certainly going to see massive impact from uh, DNA and other uh, uh, gene mutations in cancer and other kinds of diseases like that. I think AI, uh, I don't know enough about its application in, in, in healthcare, but it will certainly help the service part of healthcare dramatically. Uh, and whether it helps the medicine itself, I'm sure it will, but I, I, I don't know in what ways. Mm -hmm. So what, when you think about the span of your activities, both through the business space and, and what you've done in Endeavor, et cetera, what do you know for sure today that you didn't know 10 years ago? What do I know for what sure? What do you know for sure? What do I know for sure? that tomorrow will be different than today. Uh, that the world is changing at such an increasing rate that we can't really predict it. Uh, that every industry is going to be uh, upended. Uh, it's gonna have to find new ways. And uh, that's why I like to keep my hand in the media business. I have a little uh, venture capital fund uh, that invests in technology and media because it's a space that most venture capital uh, organizations don't pay attention to. Uh, and I enjoy doing that. But the one thing I know for sure is today, tomorrow will look different than today. Mm -hmm. And across all the countries that Endeavor deals in, are there parts of the world that you're more optimistic about the opportunity unfolding and parts less so? You know, I agree with what was said up on the stage. It's an interconnected world. Uh, we're in every country in the GCC. Uh, we're in every country except for Venezuela in Latin America. We're in Southeast Asia. Um, we're in the United States, uh, and you know, if if it and we're in Europe, a and if one goes bad, you know, there there there. If, some, if one of them gets the flu, everyone's going to catch a cold. Mm -hmm. So I, I I I do think though that this region, particularly the UAE, is a tremendous example of what leadership and entrepreneurship can do for a country. So we're just about out of time. Why not? What are you most hopeful about going forward? I'm, I, I wish I were more hopeful. I'm hopeful that we can solve the climate change issue. I'm hopeful that we can scale that industry fast enough to make an, uh, an impact and, and at least stabilize, if not reverse, climate change. Most people don't know that, that direct air capture is possible at an economic price, and they will discover that uh, in the next few months, and I'm excited about that. 
Great. Well, I think you being the catalyst towards moving capital and ideas towards that are going to be very helpful towards the solution. Yeah. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks thank so you. much. Thank you.